Case number six, very interesting, mad cow disease. This, this was British disease of the time. This was a, a farmer's wife up in Durham who developed severe neurologic disease, weakness, ataxia, slurred speech, memory loss, jerks, movement disorders, muscle fasciculation, and being a farmer's wife, they wondered about BSE, and she was tested, found negative, but luckily the neurologist tested antiphospholipid antibodies, very strongly positive. She had widespread lesions on her brain, small dots, uh, her anticardiolipin was high, all other tests negative. She was treated, of course, with warfarin, with one of the most dramatic improvements it's possible to see. And she's very interesting because she requires an INR of precisely 3.7, absolutely precisely, it falls below 3.7, the movement disorder returns. What's her lesson? Again, the cartoon I showed this morning, there are some patients who know their INR. If it falls below a certain level, and that level may be high, maybe 3.8 or even 4, much to the consternation of, of nurses in anticoagulant clinics. But it's important to follow those patients. They do know their own bodies. Case number seven, seizures and pregnancy. Um, I'm not going to talk much about seizures because we have talked about it during the meeting, but this is a girl aged 15 with seizures and headaches, um, treated in those days with phenobarbitone, and at the age of 31 was finally diagnosed as mild lupus, but strongly positive antiphospholipid. And she's got married and is inquiring about pregnancy treatment. How would you handle this? What are the risks? Well, first of all, epilepsy. We know, as I've showed you this morning, that some patients with APS and seizure disorders improve with anticoagulation. So if you have epilepsy, for instance, in a lupus patient, do think about antiphospholipids and think maybe in, about anticoagulants. But in pregnancy, things have changed out of all recognition. My colleague, Dr. Kamashta, youthful looking in a beard here, um, runs the clinic every week with an obstetric doctor and a pediatric advisor. So it's a lovely clinic and these women come for A, counseling and B, monitoring. And the fetal outcome has responded out of all recognition. This is the great story of the syndrome, that previous live births in our clinic were only 19%, and they're now over 90, in fact. And this is recorded throughout most centers dealing with APS. So it's been a lovely story of success, treatment with aspirin and heparin in the worst cases through pregnancy. But this is another doctor's letter. Dear Dr. Kamashta, who is my colleague, uh, Mrs. Smith has had a stillbirth. Could APS be a risk factor? Well, tragically, it could. Um, we see patients who've not been tested, who've had two miscarriages, three miscarriages, and later, even worse, a stillbirth at eight months, or eight and a half months. And if we look around the UK at pregnancy testing, which they should know about, we did a big survey and we found, we looked at 11 UK NHS trusts. Five did not include anticardiolipin in their routine assays. Um, St. Thomas's Hospital, my hospital, to my shame, does not include the $10 ACL test in screening. For instance, it does include syphilis, for goodness sake. So, you know, it's so outdated and yet um, so important. Obstetrics doctors say miscarriage is common. Statistically, you have to wait until the third miscarriage before you test. But I, I passionately really don't believe that. If your family has one miscarriage, you should be tested to prevent further miscarriages. About six months ago in the Times of London, there was a leader raging at the stillbirth scandal in the United Kingdom, that still stillbirth is not fully treated or not properly treated in the UK. We know that antiphospholipid antibodies, as you will expect, 
uh, are found in stillbirth. And this is one such study, a three to five-fold increased uh, odds of stillbirth in APL-positive individuals. So how do you monitor these patients? And this may well apply in psychiatry too. Who would you choose to test for anticardiolipin antibodies? And I'd like to propose clinical three questions. And these three questions are obvious, but you should ask them. Have you had a thrombosis? Um, are you a migraine sufferer? And do you have a family history of autoimmune disease? And by that I mean lupus, rheumatoid, MS, or thyroid disease. And those, to me, statistics, never, I'm not an epidemiologist, but those really point you towards an at-risk group. And I, I think it would bring down the level at which you are suspicious to do this small test. The cause of the miscarriage is almost certainly placental infarction, sticky blood, but there are other mechanisms being looked at. There are animal models now. This is uh, one of Schoenfeld's. This is the little APL mouse. And guess what these mouse get, mice get? They get a fetal death. And the top shows a, a one, two, three, six, seven normal fetuses. And at the bottom, the offspring all died of a, an APL mouse. So this is a useful animal model for looking at aspirin and heparin and other methods. And this here is very exciting data. This comes from Miri Blank. And they've looked, they've looked at IVIG, not just the bucket full of IVIG that we give to patients, but they've purified anti-beta-2, purified from the, they've looked at the particular IVIG bit that affects uh, the beta-2. And what they showed, it inhibited trophoblast invasion, and the pregnancy outcome in these mice improved 200-fold. So really things are, are moving on. Case number eight, the tests are negative. Here's a lady of 36 with classical features, migraine all her life, thrombocytopenia, age 17, five miscarriages between the ages of, and then a stroke, a, T, a transient ischemic attack at the young age of 35. Family history, Absolutely positive. What we see every day of the week, thyroid antibodies uh, in the family history, sister with stroke, sister with multiple sclerosis, sister with proven APS. To my mind, she has the antiphospholipid syndrome, but our tests are negative. When you examine her, she had two key findings, and I've mentioned them earlier. One is levido reticularis, such a, a useful and, and sinister sign, and a dry Schirmer's test, that blotting paper eye test, which really is dry if you have autoimmune diseases. MRI showed focal lesions, so she's already getting into serious trouble. Her regular screen was negative, coagulation screen entirely negative. So what's this patient teaching us? I believe, and many others do, that there now is a thing called seronegative APS. Life gets harder. But there are patients who fit the criteria where the tests are negative. Does it exist? Well, it, it may be that it's the wrong diagnosis, of course. It may be that the positive tests previously have become negative, and occasionally we see that over the years. But I think the answer is we still are not clever enough. We need new tests. For instance, recently, or a few, couple of years back, we sent some of our seronegative sera to colleagues in Rome who have a more sensitive test than us. And 16 of our 29 seronegative sera turned out positive in their tests. So I think that's a hint that new tests are really still needed. Levido reticularis, so important. So you heard in the, in the talk before last about diagnostic pointers. I, I, as you know, I'm a passionate anti-criteria man. I, I don't like committee medicine. But if you're by the bedside and you have a case of psychiatric disease where you think there may be sticky blood or antiphospholipid, I think these are points that are each worth, you know, a, a half a point. A dry Schirmer's test, keep on about that, but that's a useful test. Migraine, common. Arterial thrombosis. 
doesn't not a feature of other clotting disorders. Livido reticularis, heart murmurs are not seen particularly at all in other clotting disorders. Other antibodies, this is a sign of the autoimmune background, quite common to have a weak positive ANA, quite common to have thyroid antibodies, for example, and low platelets, uh, not 20,000, but 100,000, 110,000 platelets is a clue. These, I think, are all things to think about if you're a clinical doctor. Thank you.